Welcome to the Applied Network Forensics course. We're looking at Chapter 5, Analysis Tools. Specifically, we are looking at Wireshark. My name is Arthur Solomon. I'm going to be working with you throughout these videos. So, first of all, where do we find our PCAP files? If you go to GitHub, type my name, we're pulling them out of the Applied Network Forensic repository. There is a file there called evidence underscore pcap.zip. That's where we're going to get all the key PCAPs that we use throughout this book. This chapter, we are specifically looking at evidence 01.pcap. So, before we get too much into what we're trying to accomplish, what is Wireshark? Oftentimes, Wireshark is classified as a packet analyzer. But in truth, it is a packet protocol analyzer. And the difference is, a packet protocol analyzer, it will represent captured packet data in as much detail as possible. This allows us to look at captured network traffic and to break it down and analyze it. So I went ahead and I opened up Wireshark. This is Wireshark in a nutshell. First of all, I'm using what version? I'm using version 343, that build. I have no PCAPs open or anything. So right now we're sitting at just the main Wireshark page. You'll notice all of my adapters are here and they are listening. It is seeing data, passive data on the network cards. But there is no capturing being done. Up here, we can actually select an appropriate interface. My Ethernet interface is one that actually is my physical NIC. I have several virtual NICs, so like VMNet Net 1, VMNet 2, VMNet uh, 8. Those are my virtual NICs. So in Wireshark, I would select whichever NIC I wanted, and I can go down here to the fin and I can click Start Capture. That will start capturing any of the packets that that NIC is able to receive and respond. No, well, not just respond to, but the goal here is to take anything that it can see. So I'm actually going to start a capture. And I can stop the capture by hitting the stop button. So this is all the data that it was able to collect right now. So what I want to do is I want to open up a evidence file. I want to open up evidence 01. So now that we have our evidence file open, you can also go file, open, or open recent, and you can type find the, the file. It's a traditional program in that sense. Let's talk about our navigation. We have our navigation bar up here. We have our different options. We have our file, edit, all of that good stuff. We have our dis display filter input section. We have this area right here where all of our uh, packet data is. We call that a packet list. Underneath our packet list, these are called panes. The second pane is called the packet detail pane. That is where we can see data. And at the very bottom, we get a packet byte pane. And the goal of this chapter is we're going to go through Wireshark in a little detail so that we can understand how we can navigate and what some of this means. So let's at least cover our different types of columns in our packet lists. We have the number column denoted by no. We can add, these are numbered one, two, three, four. These are the frames that are captured and they are numbered. This is the time that they come in. This column will show how long after you started the capture that the packet got captured. We can uh, change these uh, in our settings. We have a source that's going to be our source IP. And you'll notice as we uh, click on them, we can actually sort them by ascending or descending. I want to leave my them descending by our number. 
destination address, again using IPv4. We have our protoc uh, protocol area. This is the type of protocol that the packet is. Uh, you'll notice TCP, SSH, sometimes DNS, DHCP, or ARP. We have our length. This is going to be the length of the packet in bytes. And we have other information. Underneath this, we have our packet detail. So if we're looking at our number one frame, we can see frame one. We can see that it has an Ethernet 2 frame. We can see that there is a packet for IP, uh, the IPv4, Internet Protocol version 4. And then there is a, a transmission control protocol. So we see layers 2, 3, and layer 4. What's interesting here is, depending on the protocol, we may actually get layers 2, 3, 4, and 7. So for example, I want to filter HTTP. Here we have layers 2, 3, 4, and layer 7. So one of the interesting parts is now that we have all this information, what can we do with it? How do we filter it? There's so much stuff here. Well, that's where our display filters come into play. We have ways to filter things like IP addresses. So you can type IP.ADDR. That will give us our address. And you'll notice they provide little, um, examples for us. You'll also notice the bar is green. Green means it's an acceptable filter. Red means not an acceptable filter. It won't take the inputs where green, it will take the inputs. It may not be what we want, but it will take that filter. What is interesting is we also have a yellow filter, which happens occasionally. And that's more of a conditional filter based off of two intersections of something that Wireshark may not think that we want to look at. And that's really rare. So I'm going to save that conversation for an advanced chapter. Anyways, so here we're looking at IP address. We can actually tell it what address. Let's go ahead and put in an address, 1.2.168.1.30. IP address will sort either source or destination. It won't really matter. So you can see anything that is dealing with that address. If I want to search for it being just the source address, SRC. SRC will stand for source. That means the source has to match that IP address. I could also type DST, and that will be for destination. So anything that has that 1.2.168.1.30 as the destination, it will then prompt. You can filter off of all types of things. You can do protocols, HTTP, for example, or IP, if we have any IPv6, which we don't, but you could. Part of what we have to do with Wireshark is build our filtering ability. What we're doing in this chapter is literally just talking about basic filters so that we can build our understanding and our expertise within Wireshark. So again, this is going to be kept more of a lower level. That way we can cover more of the basics. And in the next several chapters, we will talk more on the filtering aspect. All right, so I actually want to filter off of one more protocol, ICMP. So there was no ICMP there. We can also filter based off of port numbers. So let's say we know that we have a TCP dot port, we want it to be 80. So we actually have several ports, the destination ports being port 80. So if we're sending data, this isn't going to be us. This is only going to be us receiving information. In terms of actually sending out web requests over port 80, we could also do port 443.
And uh, again, you'll notice that we have destination port 443. So we can filter off of those ports. If we have suspect someone is using port 20 or 21 or 22, we can do that. Now remember 22 is not just SSH. Sometimes it is SCP, Secure Copy Protocol. But again, that's more of an advanced topic. So those are basic, basic, basic filters. Our chapter talks about being able to filter based off of flags, for example. So we can do a TCP dot flag, and you can see the different flags that it knows about. Acknowledgement, CWR, ECN, FIN, NS, PUSH. All of those are discussed in details in our chapter, and we're gonna discuss these even deeper in the following chapter when we're talking about layer four technologies. So for now, let's just filter based off an acknowledgement. So you can filter off of the flag, ACK, or you can filter based off of the hexadecimal number. So instead of doing acknowledgement, we could do flags equals equals, and our acknowledgement number is 0x010. And that should filter based off of our acknowledgement. And it looks like they are. So other filters that we can do are things that contain the word contain. So if we're looking at a frame that contains, um, well, let's go ahead and use the uh, word traffic. This says search frames that contains the word traffic. This is the, this is going to be the filtered word. If we want to do packets, if you spell it correctly. Oh, that is right. They actually removed the word packets. They only allow you to do it off of layer two and layer four. So you can actually do a layer four protocol. So UTP, for example, oh, UDP contains traffic or TCP. So if you're searching for specific words, you can do searching in that regards. We've already talked about flags. We've already talked about containing. We also have the ability to combine several filter options. All right, so one more before we talk about combining. I want to talk about HTTP. So HTTP, we can search based off of that. We can also say we want to see the request methods. And I want to see requests. I want to see anything that got a get request. So it should be. Oh, I forgot the word, dot method. So these will be my two get requests. Remember with HTTP, it retrieves web content via get requests. This will be slightly more important as we're trying to see searching, for example. So we can say get requests and something else or something else. So let's go ahead and let's try to use some options. So I want to go back. I want to sort all of my uh, all of my packets. I want to go ahead and I want to do an IP dot source. And I want that to equals. 192.168.1.2. Double ampersand allows us to do and. If we want or, it will be two straight lines. That will give us or. And that's what I'm going to do is IP source IP.SR. And I want that equal to 182.168.1.30. You know what? 
not 10. So you'll notice it's still red. You have to make sure to do double equal signs. And that will filter. So the IP source will either be 192.168.1.2 or the IP source will be 192.168.10. I can go further if I want and I could do and destined IP.dst. I see turning it yellow. That means our responses may not yield the results that we want. 2.168.1.30. My uh, keyboard is not liking equal sign right now. So that lets me sort by anything that has 192.168.1.2 or 192.168.1.10 and where the destination is 192.168.1.30. So you can actually filter this several different ways. Interesting enough is we also have our history, little down arrow. We also have a plus sign. This will give us our advanced filtering. If we remove our filtering, we also have the ability, notice this says enter a filter expression. We can do regular expression filtering here as well if we wanted to. So we have lots of options for our filtering. So now that we've talked about our con concatenating operations, now let's go ahead and let's just talk about other features. You'll notice here we have a bunch of TCP. Well, we know TCP does communication in streams. So we can actually right click any TCP, type follow, and we can see the TCP stream. You'll also notice in the filter option, it uh, puts in the command tcp.stream equals zero. This is our first stream. This is our second stream. You'll notice it even says equals one, equals two, equals three, equals four, equals five, equals six, and that's it. So this is how we can follow the different communication sessions. You'll notice as you click between them, here we have the first set. This is going to be one set of packets. This will be the next set of packets. This will be a response, but you'll notice it actually changes. So this was packets 230. This one, the response is 232. Another response to that was 233, 236. So this one being 233 and this one being 236. Realistically, this one probably encompasses 233 and 234 probably was really large sending data. And we can see that this has some HTTP content. We can see that it actually says HTML, it has a website, it has HTML coding, has a web URL, it has a user agent called a Mozilla. All of that kind of denotes, hey, this is probably a web request. We're going to talk about that more in chapter four. Sorry, this is chapter five. More of that in chapter six. But for now, it was important to note that you can see the different sessions, the different streams for this data. All right, so that's enough about our basic filters. Now let's talk about how we can obtain other information in Wireshark. One of the big ones is going to be analyze. You'll notice that's where we get our filters. That's where we get our follow from also. We'll notice we have TCP and HTTP streams. So you can see this is an HTTP stream, even though it's also a TCP stream, because HTTP is a TCP-based protocol. I don't care about that. I'm going to go back to our first frame. More importantly, we have our statistics tab. 
And this is where we're going to probably be digging the most amount of information when using Wireshark. Again, keep in mind, Wireshark is not the only tool out there. If we're doing PCAP analysis, we've already talked about things like Network Miner and other tools. Later in this book, we'll talk about other protocol analyzers outside of Wireshark. So again, this chapter is dedicated to Wireshark, so that's what we're focusing on in this section. So statistics, we have a capture file property. We can see when we click on it, we can see packets, time, we can see OS, we can see uh, created when it terminated, the time it took to capture everything. So we can get some hashes, so we can verify uh, functionality, we can get uh, length and size. That gives us details about this PCAP file. We also have a resolved addresses. This is going to be different ports, different port numbers, different host numbers that it knows about. It knows that these MAC addresses are attached to these manufacturers. For what we're doing, that's outside the normal that we need. We have a protocol hierarchy. I'm actually going to go ahead and modify this a little bit. So we can see that all of our data sent were in frames. Well, layer two information is called the frame. Happens to be that the most common layer two frame is called ethernet. If we are capturing data at an ISP and they happen to use a combination of ethernet and MPLS, some of the protocols for layer two might be MPLS frames, not ethernet frames. But most of our examples throughout this course are going to focus on Ethernet as it's the most common. So underneath Ethernet, we will have our layer 3 data. Our layer 3 comes in three main flavors, IPv4, IPv6, and ARP. You'll see that 91.7% of our packets are coming from IPv4. We have 8.3% being ARP requests. So let's go ahead and expand out our IPv4. We can now see our layer four data. Our layer four data is gonna be either UDP, TCP, or ICMP. Those are all covered more advanced in our next chapter, but in this we're looking at more of the statistical data of how much data was sent. So you'll see that 19.6% of the packets were UDP, or 47 packets out of the 240 packets. Or you can see it based off of size, bits, bytes per second. So 72.1% of the overall traffic was TCP. That means 173 packets of TCP-based data were, was sent. So we can expand out both of those guys. So we can see what services were running under UDP. Simple Service Discovery Protocol, NTP, NetBIOS, and DNS. NetBIOS name service took up the bulk of that UDP. If we're looking at TCP, we can see that TLS took over 28%, SSH, HTTP, and just raw data took up the rest. This allows us to see where the bulk of our data is coming from. But you'll notice 72% of our packets were TCP, 173 to total packets. That meant a lot of that came from this section right here. So that just lets you know that a lot of that data was using TLS. We can also look at HTTP and 1.7% of the overall traffic or four packets were HTTP. That just allows us to see 
a breakdown of the data that was sent. So that covered our protocol hier hierarchy. We can see conversations. We can see conversations based off of layer two data, MAC address A to MAC address B. We can see it based off of IPv4 data, again, source and destination. We can see it based off of IPv6, if there is any. We can see it based off of UDP ports or TCP ports. So here we have the different ports. So if we're doing this in real life and we see a bunch of uh, ports, again, source ports aren't really as important as destination ports. We see a bunch of uh, ports going into port 20. Well, if we know our networking services, we know 20 is part of FTP. If we see a bunch of port uh, data going to port 443, we know that's part of HTTP. So this lets us know what services are being ran on the network. We see web traffic, web traffic, web traffic, web traffic, and web traffic. That way we can see kind of that breakdown. We can also see what UDP traffic is there. 137, 138, 123. That lets us know what type of traffic. And again, you'll notice packet A to B and responses, packet B back to A. So again, if we are looking at source and destination, source will be A, destination will be B. So we can look at packets sent from A to B and we can look at packets responding to B back to A. Source, destination, destination back to source. These allow us to see our conversations. Interesting thing to note is in our ethernet, we get name resolution. We can actually see the names of some of the vendors. So if we are looking for a specific piece of hardware and we know it's an Apple product, for example, we may get a clue here about the manufacturer being Apple. Here we have all of them being VMware, we have an HP, and we have a Dell. That Dell happens to be just the broadcast, so we can ignore that. But you'll notice on all of the other tabs, that name resolution is gone. And you can also, again, see that follow stream. So as we see different uh, sections, you can follow the stream. Streams happen to be just in layer four, TCP and UDP. That's why you only see the follow stream in this section. All right, so that's enough for conversations. Let's go back to statistics. We can see endpoints. These are gonna be all of our endpoints. You can see it off of our Mac addresses, our IPv4 addresses, if we had any IPv6 addresses, based off of our TCP port numbers, based off of our UDP port numbers. What I like the most here is again name resolution based off of our MAC addresses, but you can see what MAC addresses are sending the most amount of packets, what's receiving or transmitting the most amount of data whether it be in packets or in bytes, all depending on what we're looking for. And again, you can do that based off of IP address as well, which IP address is sending and receiving the most packets or bytes. This lets us know several crucial things. For example, who is sending the most amount of packets? This guy. So that might be an address we wanna look at. You'll notice it's a private IP address it is sent 135 and actually equates to the most amount of data being sent or received. We can look at transmitted data. So this guy, 205.188.13.12, actually sent the most amount of data. It sent 29,000 bytes of data. If we're looking at who received the most amount of data, this guy again, 192.168.1.159, received the most amount of data. These are just things of interest as we start our analysis. And again, part of what we're gonna be doing is piecing these pieces of information together to figure out what we can do with it. 
So we also have packet length. We can see the count. We can see the average length. Again, these are going to be packets between 0 and 19 uh, bytes, 20 and 39 bytes, and so forth. So you can see the bulk of our packets were between 40 and 160 bytes in size. That way you can see these two actually make up, you know, 60, 70% of our overall traffic sent or received. We can also look at our graphics. If we want to look at all packets, we can filter based off of different graph names. We can do it based off of display filters. And right now, this is outside the scope of our basic entry. And then we also have dedicated services if we want to look at any of those. Here we can look at our specific statistics tied to IPv4, for example. This will show us just IPv4 instead of having to go to endpoint and clicking on IPv4. Again, multiple ways to do things. It just kind of depends on what we are wanting to do. So, how does any of this relate to what we're going to be doing in our analysis? Since we talked about conversations and we talked about uh, name resolution and we talked about how we examine things, Part of this is going to be information overload. How do we actually look at this and analyze it appropriately? And that is what we really need to understand how to do. So I'm going to be looking at data frame 1 in my evidence 01 PCAP file. First of all, you'll notice here we have our frame 1. This is going to be more related to our layer 1 information, which that doesn't do me any good. This is going to be related to our layer 2, layer 3, and layer 4 information. And you'll notice down here it actually highlights different sections. Layer 2, this is a part of the data that has layer 2 information. This is the part of the, uh, the data that has layer 3 information. This is the part that has layer 4 information. So we can see that that entire thing consists of layer 2, 3, and layer 4 information. So let's go ahead and click on Ethernet 2. You'll notice it uses this information down here. I'm going to put the carrot next to it. You'll notice source, destination, and type. Destination, source, type. And you'll notice as we click on them, this lets you know this is the MAC address. This is the source MAC address. This is the version or the ether type. You'll notice 0800 happens also to denote it's an IPv4 based packet. So let's go ahead and click on the packet part. You'll notice right after it denotes the version, it gives us our packet details. So let's go ahead. I'm going to close out my Mac. I want to look at my packet information. First of all, you'll notice version, version 4. We'll also get a header. That 4 and that 5 are denoted right here. That denotes the version of packet, whether it be IPv4, IPv6, or ICMP. Sorry, I, it will be either IPv4, IPv6, or ARP. This will also denote the header length, 20 bytes, also represented the number 5. Next, we have things like our total length. Total length is 52 bytes. What's interesting is, it says 52 here, but it says 34 down here. Alright, so what I want to do is in decimal, decimal, I want to type 52. 52 in decimal actually equals 34 in hex. This down here is hex. This is decimal. So this right here denotes the total length. You'll notice the next part, the D388. 
will denote the identification. This is important, but it's not the more important sections. This is all part of the IP header. Offset's important. The TTL, however, is extremely important. The TTL actually lets you know what type of operating system the device is. A TTL of 64 decimal actually lets you know this is a Linux type machine. If the TTL was 128, this right here would actually be 80. Now let you know it's a Windows machine. If the TTL happened to be 27 decimal or 39 hexadecimal, it would let you know this is a Mac. So again, the important ones to denote are going to be version, header length, total length, our TTL, and next will be our protocol. Our protocol right here will let you know the type of protocol layer 4 is. Layer 4 is going to be TCP, UDP, or ICMP. Layer 4 and layer 7 are covered more in depth in the next chapter. Protocol TCP, so that actually will list our protocol. Next, our source IP address. Again, this is in hex. This will be our destination IP address. And if we click on our layer 4, our TCP, you'll notice it highlights the rest of it. Layer 4 highlights this, and you'll notice the D8C0 is actually the beginning of our TCP data. So that is basic overview of Wireshark in a nutshell, and a brief explanation of how we break down this information. Again, predominantly this chapter we looked at Ethernet and we looked at IPv4 and understanding the detailed information in this section. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.